Coming up on today's show, Jose Abreu is off the board, an old friend joins Pittsburgh, and Clevenger is a Sox? Or is it Sock? What, what is the, the singular of Sox? Just never sounds right. You're listening to the Selfie is Godcast with Zach Meisel and TJ Zupi. Fly ball, deep right field. Back is Spencer at the one and two at the one. Subscribe to Selby is Godcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Unbelievable. I mean, is it in the AP style guide? Would you say he's a sock or is he still a socks? How does that work? I've always wondered this. I, I know you still write it. With the X, even when it's singular, like you don't, no one writes like he became a white sock, S O C K. You don't write that. No, but when you're speaking it out loud, that doesn't sound right either. That he's that he is a socks. No, <laughs> you wouldn't say that. No, how how do people on podcasts say this? We need but to hit up our friends that do. White Sox or Red Sox podcast to know how like, you would say singular socks. Colin Sexton became a jazz. What is that? Yeah, that's Jimmy true. Butler that's weird. Became a heat. <laughs> Who did the I'm a heat? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> that was an old Kenny wrote a bit. I'm a heat. I don't remember who said that. <laughs> Uh, and this show has not started hot whatsoever. But, uh, you know, for a show that has a ton of headlines to get to, let's start the first two minutes of the show by talking about complete nonsense. I'm TJ Zach. If you have forgotten, welcome back to the Selby is Godcast. And despite it being the off season, and typically when we get together, there aren't a lot of headlines. I feel like there are quite a few headlines that we can start with. And you could really just kind of throw a dart at the board and see what you pick. So did you get out that wheel of fun that you purchased over the, the season? Give that a spin? See if it's going to be Abreu? Is it going to be Carlos Santana? Is it going to be Clevenger? Is it going to be Luke Maley, no longer a, a, a guardian? That sounds right. What do you got on that wheel, bud? How about Luke Maley? He wore a Joe Burrow jersey for much of September. So good for him going home where he is a red. That's it. Next. Anything else to add? No. <laughs> Great. I'm glad we've started the show this way. Well, at least I know he won't be part of the catching situation here in Cleveland. So that there, there, there's something. There, there's some clarity on the catcher that it won't be Luke Maley, I guess. Mm-hmm. Let's journey over to something that makes a little bit more of a splash as far as people caring about it. I'll say Jose Abreu. I'll, I'll rank that number one on the list of things to talk about today. I don't know realistically how people felt about him playing in Cleveland. To me, it always felt like a near certainty that he was going to go back to Chicago, that this was all just a just an elaborate ploy to get more money out of Chicago. Well, joke's on me. He's in Houston, and he got three years, $60 million total to do it, more than I ever thought that he would have gotten for a guy that is of his age. Now, he was, we, we covered it recently. He had a very interesting year. He was good last year, has been good for many years. Even when he signed that most recent deal with Chicago, I thought, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I would touch that. And he proved to be a very productive player, won an MVP for Chicago. So do you continue to bet on this guy? Would you have been comfortable with a three-year, $60 million commitment for him? doesn't matter if you were because Houston was and he's now an Astro. Yeah, it's tough. I think when a player makes drastic changes or has drastically different results, still good results, he had a really good year and is projected to have a really good year in 2023. 
but you want to know why you want to understand what those changes could signal about the future and the, the aging curve. And you're going, the Houston's going to be paying him when he's what? 38 years old is his age 38 season. What can you expect out of that? Now they won't be affected by dead money. If he falls off a cliff like Cleveland would be, or like other teams who are averse to spending would be. So you can afford to take that risk. He's a perfect fit for the Astros. Um, he does have that short porch in left field now where maybe that can mitigate some of the power decline. But, I mean, he would have been a good fit in Cleveland too. I, I just, I don't know what to make of him moving forward because it was such a different season. And more than anything, the thing I take away is, you know, the White Sox have some holes. They still have a lot of talent. Like they're going, they're obviously trying to contend and they're, they're going to be a, a thorn in the side of anyone aiming for an AL Central title. But like, I don't know how they're going to, to fix all these leaks and signing Clevenger. Okay. He's interesting to me. Um, I don't know what to make of him. And you know, I think if you look under the hood, maybe at his last year or two, and especially with the injuries, you're terrified. But there is a lot of potential there. But okay, like if you're hoping he can just be your fifth starter, well, now you have a big hole offensively. You know, you can slide Andrew Vaughn over to first base full time, but they still need an outfielder. They still need a second baseman. Um, they're reportedly interested in catching help. And it seems like they don't have a ton of money to spend, and we know they don't have much of a farm system to offer. So to me, like, yeah, the Astros won the World Series, and they just got better. And I don't know if Abreu will make that contract worthwhile in the end, but for them, who cares? To me, this is more about what are the White Sox doing? And also... In the clubhouse, I, I thought Abreu was a big part of that too. So you lose him, how are you going to fill that void there? All great questions. It makes me wonder with their interest in catchers, whether or not they have a a desire to move Grandal a little bit more out from behind the plate, and maybe that revives his offense with Vaughn moving over to first base. I would want to get him out of the outfield, period, but Abreu is still a productive player. That is going to hurt them offensively, no matter what they bring in catcher-wise. I think it's going to be a, a step back somewhat, unless you think that, that Grandal is capable of, of just getting back to being healthier and, and more of a productive offensive player. I, I like the Clevenger move on the surface in, in just in a vacuum. I think that's an interesting sign. There's a lot of boom. I don't, I don't know, bust. I don't think you can have a bust on a one-year contract. Maybe bust from an expectation level. There is still that boom capability. Maybe he regains some of his form in, in Cleveland when he was pitching more like a, a top-of-the-rotation arm. I'm skeptical that that guy is ever returning. I think more of what we have seen recently is probably where he's at now. And when we've covered it, you've said that the team... The, the Guardians, when they traded Clevenger, that they didn't think that he was going to blow up soon and they needed to trade him immediately. I don't believe that. I think they knew <laughs> that there was some potential dangers on the horizon as far as health. And if he's not healthy, then he's not going to be this same cat anymore as far as a top of the rotation arm. So I still am skeptical whether he can ever get back to being there. It's a nice bet, though, yeah. on a, on that sort of contract, one year. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have been opposed. I know it would have probably taken a lot of their flexibility off the table, but I even wouldn't have been opposed with a, with a reunion in Cleveland on that sort of, of deal. But losing a Brave, that's a big blow. That's a big blow. And, yes, Houston absolutely got better, and they don't have to worry about that that big money commitment coming back to hurt them the same way that Cleveland would. I know that there are reports. I know Paul Hoynes has said that Cleveland was 
was discussing a three-year contract. If that's true, I'm surprised just in terms of length. But there was no way they were going to be able to give a three-year commitment up to $60 million. They weren't giving him that Edward Encarnacion contract. Can't see it. You have to be careful. I mean, every team can always claim to finish second on every free agent. And I, yeah. that's why when I, like, when I see that information, I need more specifics or I want to go to a neutral party as a source to, to corroborate. I mean, people were asking me, I think I reported Carlos Rodon and how they had made him an offer before last season. And I didn't report that till like August or September. And people were like, what are you waiting on so long? And I was like, well, you know, it's, there were a few things at play, but also you want to get it from a source who has no reason to lie to you. And that's not saying that the guardians are lying about this or any other, um, circumstance like it, but it's just easy. There's, you know, unless you're going to go fact checked and talk to Jose Abreu or his agent, then who like if I was a front office person, I would tell reporters constantly, hey, you know, we made a better offer, but he he wanted to go to Houston. Sorry. Like what are we supposed to do? That happens sometimes, but I'm just just saying, you know, I I don't know that the Guardians were gonna go three for sixty for a brave. That I, I I wouldn't have even advised, advised that if I you know, had a say in it, because that third year could be could be rough. But who knows? I don't know. Maybe he'll defy father time. The thing thing with Clevenger that's interesting to me is, you know, Cleveland want, they always want to move the pitcher too soon instead of too late. And then he goes to San Diego and his pitching coach is Ruben Niebla, who knows him very well. They've worked together. And you still didn't see the Clevenger we were accustomed to seeing. And injuries are a huge part of this. But you look at the track record of pitchers who have had multiple Tommy John surgeries, it ain't good. So he had other stuff going on. You know, he had a knee issue. I think he had something else too. I don't know. You know, he's not old. There's not a ton of mileage there. This isn't a guy who racked up a bunch of 200 inning seasons. But kind of one of those going to need to see it to believe it. But again, like, I will give the White Sox credit. I saw people arguing about this on Twitter. I I think the ceiling for that rotation with Cease, Giolito, Lynn, Kopech, Clevenger, the ceiling is as good as it gets. But, you know, how much does Lynn have left in the tank? We've seen the best and the worst of Giolito. Haven't seen Kopech take that next step. Cease was obviously fantastic. Um, so it's that's just it's an interesting team. They have a lot of talented players, but it doesn't all fit together, and they're gonna need a lot of guys to things to go right. But there's time, I'm sure. I'm sure they'll make some more additions. It's just gonna be hard to make substantial ones. To be clear, I don't think the Guardians should get some sort of medal, some sort of credit, some sort of ribbon for coming in. Even I don't even know if it would be second place. He might have ranked other offers better than what the Guardians were were offering if there truly was a three-year offer on the table for Abreu. I'm with you. It is much more advantageous for Cleveland to put it out there that they were offering a three-year deal as opposed to making it look like they, they didn't do anything, that they're just sitting on their hands, again, waiting for another offseason to come to them instead of going out and forcing the issue, especially in a division now where we still don't know what Minnesota's doing. Chicago just lost one of their leaders that has been there f- seemingly forever in Abreu. This division is still very much right there set up for the Guardians to, to keep seizing it and making it theirs. You want to see some activity. We've talked in length about how key this offseason is and how they have a chance to add some significant talent. So to watch Abreu come off the board and to make it look like you weren't doing anything, that doesn't look good for the organization. So, yeah, put it out there. Three years. 
Well, that, that doesn't matter. He didn't pick you. That's not why I bring it up, though. I'm just, I, I find the fact that if it's true, if they were willing to go to three years, that's that's significant to me mm-hmm. because I did not expect that. We talked about when he was on the table as far as being an option, I didn't consider anything more than a one-year commitment for him. And I was I was pretty sure he wasn't going to take that even if you gave him a, you know, $30 million to do it. So, so that's what speaks more to me. That's what I find interesting about that report. Again, if it is truly what the organization was considering. Yeah, I, I mean, there are always other things at play. I remember when, remember when um, Todd Frazier got traded to, I think it was to the White Sox from the Reds, and the Indians at the time they were in on that, but the Reds had asked for like Danny Salazar or Cody Allen as the centerpiece, and the prospect that the Reds got, I think it was a three-team deal with the Dodgers. And the prospect the Reds ended up getting was like not not worth me remembering the name, apparently. And that was one of those where I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. You know, you can go boast about, oh, we were in on it. We thought we had Todd Frazier. But then I like I checked and it was it was legitimate. It, it was a good example of what we always talk about where teams value especially young players so much differently than like we would assume based on public rankings. And it's the same thing with free agents too. I mean, I I think there are definitely cases. I don't know exactly what Cleveland offered Rodon in the spring, but from what I was initially told, and this is not from guardians people, it was, it was a much better deal than what he got from the giants. Now, I, it might not have had, you know, he had like the incentives and the opt outs that allow him to be a free agent again this winter. And it's going to allow him to sign for north of a hundred million dollars, most likely. Um, so there's a lot of things in play there, but you, you never know, like, like a lot of it depends on what a player really wants, what teams really want. Sometimes teams are just infatuated with a player that you never would understand. Um, so that's what makes this all tricky, and that's what makes it easy. I mean, it's not just – we don't need to just pick on the Guardians here, but like I, the, the Celtics earned a reputation of doing this where everyone who was traded or signed or whatever, they always said – like it became a running joke that the Celtics finished second. So that stuff happens. Mm-hmm. I, I think for me, you know, Bray was off the table. I, You're right. I mean, it, I think it shows that they – could be more aggressive this winter that they understand the objective at hand and they're going to actually make a valiant effort to, to fill the the holes in this lineup and put out a, a contender that can at least attempt to hang with Houston and whoever else in the American league. To me, the guy is Josh Bell. I think he's the best fit if we're just talking about, first base DH types, um, switch hitter, not a stark difference in platoon splits, a guy who has hit for power in the past guy who walks a lot, who really improved his strikeout rate. His strikeout rate was about 15% last season. That's fantastic. So I don't know what sort of deal he would command, but probably not going to be as much as a Bray you got. And if they're willing to, play in that ballpark no reason why josh bell can't be a guardian i would think i disagree i disagree with you though i think he does better than abreu hmm. in large part due to his age i'm i'm talking I, more average annual value though you think he gets more than 20 million a year yeah i i, I don't know the fact that Abreu got that deal plays well for for Josh Bell, that he can say, "I'm younger than this this guy. I can play the field for you longer than this guy can. I can switch hit." So, it, I'm at least comparable 
if not better than him. That's, that would be my pitch if, if I'm him. I, I was expecting all along for him to get a better deal than Abreu did. So the fact that Abreu gets three for 60, I would not be surprised if Josh Bell got four years. Interesting. I what I will say. Like three for 45. But you're right. I wouldn't have expected three for 60 for Abreu. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it changes things. Or maybe I'm off base here and, and they just value something else that, you know, I'm not seeing with Abreu. And I like Abreu. I think it would have been a great fit. Just not not knowing their capabilities at three for 60. If it's not my money, yeah, three for 60, do it. <laughs> I don't care. But knowing the realities here, that's where it got difficult. I'm with you. I, we talked about this weeks ago. I said he would have been a fantastic fit talking about Josh Bell. I think he offers a lot of what you like. He's got a little bit of that that Carlos Santana g- gene in him where he's going to walk. He is the switch hitter. So you're always getting some baseline good offense from him. Even he goes to San Diego because he has those underlying skills. I still believe he's a productive player, even coming off of that terrible part of the season with the Padres. I disagree with some of the sentiment, though, in our discord in regard to Bell. I had seen, I don't remember who, but someone had said, well, if they don't go three for 60 for a Abreu, that takes Bell off the table. I think they're completely different conversations here. I don't think you can look at just one player and say, well, they weren't willing to do that. So that tells us they they aren't going to chase Y player because they didn't go get X player. I, I think it's different. Are, aren't all these situations viewed differently? Are, aren't all of them put into a different sort of model that spits out what a team is willing to do. I think the age stands in the way of giving Abreu that significant guarantee, or as opposed to Bell, I'm not as concerned about that because he is significantly younger. And I think the team puts that into the, into their model and it would tell them a similar thing. Don't you think? Yeah, I I think just because you're in on Abreu doesn't mean you're going to be in on every first baseman. And, I mean, they have been very selective in their pursuits over the last year or so. Remember, when they went after Olsen and Winker, it wasn't like, okay, well, let's pivot to whoever's next on the free agent list and go down one tier and then chase the next guy. It was like, Let's chase these few guys, and then if we can't get the guys that we really like, we're not doing anything. It was the same thing at the trade deadline. They didn't really like Contreras. They couldn't get a deal for Murphy. Well, they didn't go trade for Christian Vasquez. You know, so it all depends on their preferences. For what it's worth, Fangraphs has Bell at 3 for 39. Um, I think they had a Brayu at 2 for 40. I'd have to go back and check. But so I. It depends, and obviously they're not going to tip their hand on what that hierarchy looks like, but I, I do think it shows a couple things. One, it shows, you know, even if it wasn't going to be three for 60 for Abreu, like, it shows they have, and Chris Antonetti said this on the record, like, they have financial flexibility. We still don't really know exactly what that means, because they claim they don't know what that means, and we haven't heard from David Plitzer, who I think still is the minority owner on this team. The guy's a ghost, but, or maybe he's not a ghost. He just owns like 73 different sports franchises. Um, but, but again, I, I always come back to what we have talked about the last couple of weeks in that what you do in one spot does affect what you do in another. You know, if they're going to go give a first baseman a three year deal well, then they're probably not going to give a catcher a three-year deal with a lot of money. You know, so maybe you have, I think you have to, if you want to make two upgrades, assuming they're both position players, I think one is a free agent and one is via trade, right? Most likely, yeah. And if that's the case, it feels like the catcher is the trade. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. 
I was quickly trying to pull it up. As far as the the crowd source said over at Fangraphs, Bell had their their median crowd source had it at three for thirty nine, and Abreu just had it here. Abreu was two for thirty two. Hmm. It, it'll so be interesting. I, I'm fascinated. I, I'm fascinated to see what the Abreu signing does for Bell's market. On in one hand, you see what Abreu got, so you're doing what I was just doing. If I'm the agent, I'm saying, "Look, he's younger. He's a switch hitter. He plays the field. All these things." You also just took the Astros off the board as far as someone that is willing to give a first baseman a lot of money. So it's not always just, well, my guy's better. Yes, that might be true. But if one of the teams, one of the suitors, one of the main suitors just came off the board, and I think a lot of people had connected Bell to Houston as as far as being a, a very legitimate connection there, well, then you're only worth what someone is willing to pay, right? <laughs> if no one's willing to pay you more than Abreu, and, and the, the only team that maybe would have considered that just signed Abreu for whatever reason, then you're not worth that. But I think that'll be fascinating. And I think Bell is, an, is a name that I would continue to watch. I don't know that Cleveland would jump at him, but it certainly is someone that if his market is kind of doing what we have seen with with guys at that position and no one has really jumped up to make a giant offer like a Bray you just got that makes so much sense for Cleveland like too much sense for Cleveland is he almost like a like his nailer ceiling Josh Bell I just think the combination of power mm. And, well, Naylor will never have the walk rate Bell has had. But the contact ability, I, I, I really, you know, the more I study him, the more I think Bell's a really good fit for what they like to do offensively. You know, before, he had a rough go when he was traded to the Padres at the deadline. His numbers in San Diego were brutal. So, like, I don't want to just throw out this season, but, you know, I would need to, do more talk to Padres people to see what happened there. But prior to 2022, this guy always ranked near the top of the league in exit velocity, max exit velocity, hard hit rate. So you have that skill set there. The walk rate's always been good. Not a guy who chases a lot. And then I'm just amazed at the strikeout rate. 15.8% this season. That is, if if you come keep that there, keep walking, get back to the the hard hit tendencies you had. That's mm -hmm. a really good hitter, and you're a switch hitter. Yeah, and you I can mean, play as, every single day. As far as the K's go, too. To your point, he has only one time been above nineteen point two percent in K's, and it came in the shortened twenty twenty season. 57 games, is that, that enough to, to, to say that that was an entire season for him? Hell no, we've covered that at length. I'm throwing that out. I'll, I'll look much more at the rest of his career where he's been not just a solidly above average hitter, but at times significantly above average as far as uh, weighted runs created plus. Always drawing walks, always getting up. He carries a 351 career on base percentage. He was terrible with the Padres. Still finished with a 362 on base percentage last year and 23% above average, despite being borderline unplayable for the Padres after they traded for him. And, you know, you, you trade a guy. We, we've talked about how maybe difficult it could be. Just you're in a new situation, new environment. You've got to acclimate yourself to new teammates. That ballpark, I, I don't know. Does that play into someone not feeling great or, or maybe feeling like they need to change certain aspects of, of their offensive profile? I don't know. I, I would bet on Bell, though, because even if he isn't going all world, 
I always know that he's going to be right around 20% better than league average. A lot of it because he he's going to take the walks and he fits what Cleveland wants to do now. It just seems like a an excellent fit. Lengthens out that lineup. When you can plug a switch hitter in there too, another switch hitter somewhere behind Jose Ramirez. Uh, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And And what it tells you, too, you know, if they are going to make an effort to to add someone in that role, then they aren't committed. They're not married to the idea of keeping the DH spot open. And you can keep it open part of the time if Josh Naylor is on the bench against certain left-handers. So I think... It's interesting. I mean, I, I guess that shows a commitment to Oscar Gonzalez in right field, too, because you're not flirting with the temptation to stick him at DH and play Brennan out there. And you could still do this part of the time again, um, but they're not afraid to add another defensively limited player. And that's good. You know, I think. It was nice. It, it paid dividends in certain respects once Framil Reyes was let go to keep that DH spot open. They were able to get guys off their feet. They were able to shuffle in new young players, and it didn't matter what position they played. It was a way to get Tyler Freeman some exposure, Will Brennan, Will Benson. Uh, but I think they realize, you know, they have to have just the best nine man lineup they can. And adding someone who can hit for power and draw walks yeah. and still make a lot of contact. Because when he's, like you said, when he's slumping, when Framo Reyes was slumping, there's nothing you could do. He had that stretch where he was, what, like 0 for 29 with 18 strikeouts? And you just have to sit through that and bear with it and pray that it ends soon. With Josh Bell, if he goes through an 0 for 29, you can bet there's going to be seven walks in there. And also a guy who makes that much contact probably is not going to have a slump that, that lasts that long. So that fits in this lineup. You don't want to add power just to add power. You know, you don't need Mark Reynolds in this lineup. You need a good hitter. <laughs> if they can hit for power, that's great. The, 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 the Whoa, the Reynolds that everyone wanted to extend <laughs> in 2013. That Reynolds, yeah. So the, the guy that stood pitch. at his locker and told it <laughs> told us that we would be ripping him in a matter of months, and he was right. He was out the, of a job at the end the of the sales season. Pitch that, that you gave on Josh Bell's behalf is the antithesis to what Reynolds did, where he was on a one-year deal and he could have pounded his chest and boosted his ego and boasted to the world and said, "Hey, all you media members, go tell Chris Antonetti to sign me to a ten-year extension." Because I'm the real deal. And instead he was like, no, nah, I know I'm hot now, but just wait, I'm going to get ice cold. And he did. <laughs> and in August, he was gone. Oh, man. Imagine the agent just sitting there listening to that. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Isn't it also beneficial in regard to the whole Fran Mill keeping the DH open now, Josh Bell discussion, knowing that Naylor is your first baseman, I would much rather have a DH that is capable of playing first base as opposed to Fran Mill occasionally sliding into the outfield mm -hmm. because getting some Fran Mill could not go play first base and you could get Naylor off his feet at DH. You can't trade those back and forth. It didn't matter when Fran Mill was giving you a 30 home run season. Okay, I'll, I'll figure out my way around that. But when that's not happening, it would make more sense for this team to have someone that could also play first base. So if Naylor needs the DH to keep him healthy, uh, to keep his body right as he continues to mend from that horrific injury a couple of years ago, that's beneficial. If you want to make Bell your first baseman against lefties and it open up the, the DH at-bats for someone to slide in there as a right-hander so Josh Naylor doesn't have to face extremely tough left-handed pitching, also makes sense. There's really not much here that I can find that is a negative that that I really would be would be thinking it's not a great fit. 
The only question here is legitimacy. Are we having this conversation and it's not really a legitimate outcome that we could expect this team to have? That's sad, if that's true. I, I don't know that it is. If Cleveland was willing to go to three years on Abreu, they damn sure better be willing to go three years on Josh Bell. I'll say that. That should be where they're living. He's not going to break the bank. He is not someone that's going to command $100 million or more. This is not one of the top free agents. This is the type of guy that you should absolutely be in the conversation to sign, given where they're at, given what their payroll is, given the some sense of flexibility that they've been boasting about this offseason. I, I think there's no excuse why he can't be someone that you should go chase. You shouldn't feel like that's a pipe dream. I agree. Go be the aggressor for once. You you have, I mean, how many GMs throughout the league would kill to be in the position Cleveland's front office is in this winter? You have a the league's youngest roster, and yet that youngest roster has playoff experience. You're coming off a good season, and now you have tons of trade ammunition. You've got one of the best farm systems in the league, and a lot of that talent is in the upper levels of the farm system. And you have a new minority owner, and you you tore your payroll all the way down, and now you're trying to build it back up a little bit. You have a war chest. You have every resource at your disposal to turn what was a really great, surprising season into something sustainable. That is like the dream of every every front office member to be in charge of that mission. And you have Chris Antonetti and Mike Chernoff in that position. So yeah, take advantage. You know, the worst thing you can do is just sit idle and let this be like 2008 when they ran, they made the run to the ALCS. And then what'd they do? What'd they do after 2007? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They try to run it back. It doesn't work that way. You can't just assume all these young players are going to, to take more steps forward. There's going to be some regression. It happens in baseball. Like 2022 was the anomaly. And that doesn't mean that all these guys are going to crash and burn. But you have to assume that there will be some regression. That doesn't mean you can't go win another division and contend for a World Series. You just have to make sure you mask some of your deficiencies so that when there is some regression, you have others who can carry the load and you're not mm. placing a ton of burden on George Valera to do what Oscar Gonzalez did or Logan Allen to do what Tristan McKenzie did. George Valera. Will he be part of Cleveland's future? Hmm, good question. We'll get to that in a minute. You had mentioned the Todd Frazier trade. So here it is. December 16th, 2015. Here's your big swap. <laughs> the Los Angeles Dodgers sent Brandon Dixon, Jose Peraza, and Scott Shebler to the Cincinnati Reds. The White Sox sent Micah Johnson, Frankie Montas, and Trace Thompson to the Los Angeles Dodgers. That was the thing. The Reds didn't even come, Dodgers, up, come away with the best of the trade. <laughs> yeah, the Dodgers got the better prospects. Like it didn't make it didn't make much sense, but clearly the Reds identified people that they liked in particular and that's that's what happened. It was just it was weird too because by that point Salazar and Cody Allen had established themselves so it was it was a totally different type of trade you'd be getting pre-arb major leaguers instead of prospects but you know sometimes front offices are just fixated on a certain young player for some reason and you know we talked about it with the Nolan Jones thing some people will think of that as a team trades it's a guy who was a number one prospect not too long ago for a guy who's a number 30 prospect but that's not that doesn't necessarily reflect what the teams themselves believe.